<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly discussion series that's hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with U of M Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, and CMN TV. I'm your host, We Am Nemo. And our guest today is Camilla Caesar. Hello, welcome. Hi. So Camilla is a disciple of Bella Sarwati, uh, is a specialist in Bharati Natyam, Natyam, South Indian dance, in the style of Bala Saraswati. She was born in Brooklyn, New York, and is Native American from the Mohawk tribe and Filipino. She studied the classical dance of South India, both in the United States and in India. She is the founder and artistic director of Lotus Music and Dance, a not-for-profit organization. So we're this is, you know, in honor of Native American Heritage Month. We are so happy. Uh, I'm pleased that you have the opportunity, the, the time to come and join us today and to share this interesting, your interesting background and all the things that you're involved with. Um, to start with, please tell us about your, your childhood, where you grew up and how it felt being part Native American, part Filipino. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And my mother was from the Mohawk tribe, from the Akwesasne Reservation, which is um, on the border of New York State and Canada. And my father came from uh, the Philippines. He was from the island of Panay, which is in more, you know, more southern part of the Philippines. Um, and um, that's where my mother met my father. She was, she had an interesting situation where she was one of these Native Americans that was put in a boarding school when she was very young. And so she spent most of her life in this boarding school run by the Jesuits in Canada. And when she left the school after high school, you know, in these boarding schools, they were not allowed to speak the language and they were punished if, you know, for doing anything that was Indian. So she pretty much grew up being ashamed of being Native American. So when she left, when she went back to the reservation, because she didn't speak Mohawk anymore, she couldn't communicate with her own family. And it was a, a very difficult, you know, situation for her. And since she had been educated and, you know, like she was actually sent to teach in a, on a reserve in some remote place in Canada, but she didn't like um, the location where it was. So she had a, a cousin who was Mohawk who left the reservation and moved to, you know, the, the New York City area and was married to a Filipino. And so when she contacted her cousin and got, you know, names of people that could help her, she moved to New York City and was introduced to the Filipino community because of that connection. And so that's how it all started. <laughs> so we, we grew up in Brooklyn. Until, oh, so. eighth, uh, until I was eight in the third grade, and then we moved to South Jersey. But. Okay, so um, you told us a little bit of how she was raised, given that, you know, she had to, like, not speak her language, and that she, um, and the school that she was in. But tell us a little bit about the Mohawk tribe, and how did it, how did that situation end up where it was? Well, I didn't know I was Mohawk. She didn't tell us we were Mohawk until I was in high school. So I grew up thinking I was half French Canadian and half Filipino because she was born on the Canadian, the French Canadian side of the reservation. She considered herself French Canadian. So this is a little, you know, crazy because I really didn't know very much about, you know, the Mohawk tribe until after I left home and kind of started you know looking into like what does it mean to be mohawk <laughs> um so by that time i was living in california and, and i was going to college and um you know there aren't any mohawks not very many mohawks in california because it's so far away from where they're originally from but um when i came back to new york um after having studied in uh, gone to school in California, studied Indian dance, and gone to India, and I moved back to New York. My mother would come back from, because my family had by then moved out to California, and they were all in Berkeley, 
And she wanted to come back and visit her the family that was still on the reservation. So I would go with her uh, up to the reservation, which was at that time, the only way to get there was like an eight hour bus ride um, from Port Authority, New York to up there to um, Akwesasne. And, um, and so we would go and we would visit her, the remaining family members she had on the reservation. Now they were all converted to Christianity. So we grew up and we were raised Catholic because also in the Philippines, on the Filipino side, you know, the, uh, the Spanish influence um, in the Philippines was, you know, they brought Christianity and, and, and it's a very Catholic country also. Um, so I was basically raised Catholic and um, so when I went back to the reservation with my mother and was visiting her family members, I was asking her, one of her, her youngest brother was married to a very traditional Mohawk woman whose father was a chief in the longhouse. And, and so I started asking you, what, what was that all about? You know, what is the Mohawk you know, culture all about? And so she introduced me to Tom Porter, Sago Gwenyunquist who was uh, a sub-chief in the Longhouse. And I started learning about how there's this big divide on the reservation where there are the traditional Longhouse people and then there are the Christian, um, the native people who were converted to Christianity. And, and then there were the people who were being sort of um, influenced by the government to uh, become more, you know, have a more democratic government. So there's this, there are these factions on the reservation where there's the longhouse traditional people who feel that they know already know how to govern themselves. And then there are the native people who are trying to be more democratic and having, you know, the kinds of elections, you know, according to a democratic process. And then, and, and, and they're like constantly at odds with each other. And so, um, to understand like you know the, the the mohawk people they're part of a confederacy so there are six nations that are part of the iroquois confederacy or the haudenosaunee which is how they refer to themselves the people of the longhouse and how many hundreds of thousands of years ago there was this story or the myth that the uh, that the peacemaker that the all these tribes were fighting with each other and there were, there were, the Mohawks were fighting against the Onondaga and the Senecas. And, and evidently there was a peacemaker who came who said they have to stop fighting. And there was this, there's a whole epic story that they tell in the Longhouse that tells how the peacemaker came and went to each of the tribes and explained that they needed to stop fighting and to work together and to form this confederacy or this, this union where they all had decided how they were going to live together. And that story, it's called the, uh, the Peacemaker's Journey, is told in the Longhouse every year. But because it takes 55 hours to tell the story, it goes from one nation, they take turns telling the story. And the story basically has, it's sort of like, you know, the Bible in a way, because it really is filled with all kinds of morality stories and ethics and how to conduct oneself as a human being and the importance of family. And, and um, the story, because it's told in the language of that nation in the longhouse, a lot of people today don't speak their native languages, you know, because of this whole boarding school issue and people not being allowed to speak their language. A lot of people don't speak their native languages. And so this elder that I had met um, through my aunt, Tom Porter, when I started you know, talking to him and finding out more about the longhouse tradition, he came to me one time and said, you know, if you wanna do a project, maybe you should tell the story of the peacemaker's journey <laughs> through dance. And so that was one of the things that happened, you know, like as a result of that, of that connection, we, we did a production called the peace, uh, the peacemaker's journey and told, you know, some of this, we couldn't tell all of the stories in a two hour, you know, production, but we, we kind of chose the most important points of the story and, and how the Confederacy was formed and how 
you know, it's a matriarchal society and the women, you know, choose the leaders and, and all, all of the, the history of, of the Iroquois Confederacy. Did you say that you did the story through dance? Is that yes. what you said? Okay. And was that through the Baharta dance? It was actually through, no, it was more through uh, Native American and Filipino, and there was, uh, I think, uh, another group that was involved. But it was mainly trying to tell it through a combination of narrative and dance. So there was like, yeah, there was mostly, uh, we tried to do it mostly through, you know, indigenous dance. Although and there was a ballet dancer <laughs> and it was, he was actually an uh, indigenous from Venezuela, but we had, we had met him to the dance theater Harlem and he was so interested in native, you know, the native American storytelling idea that, you know, he was in the production too. So it was kind of like a collaboration, a collaborative effort with different cultures trying mm -hmm. to tell the story. And I think you said that the Peacemaker's Journey is only in um, the, the tribal's language. It's it's it was it never translated. Is there a way that people can like read about it, or how, how has it stayed alive? Well, now now that Tom Porter recited the whole story for us, we have it. You know, we have the audio. Okay. Okay. Great. Because my yeah. Because my thing was like, oh, then how how is it staying alive? So now you have an audio of it. You just have yeah. a different way of telling. It. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. Um. So that's a beautiful history, and I'm, I'm like very curious, 55 hours, but it's, it sounds like it would be worth reading it. And I was thinking when you were saying about this peacemaker, I was like, well, is, is this peacemaker still alive? And can we take those teachings and then kind of the world really needs that kind of a person right now where they just come. The message seems simple, right? We, we all want that. But for whatever reason, we are human beings have kind of complicated things. But um, but how has you know you shared a lot about your um, your the tribe, the Mohawk tribe, and how was the Filipino influence in your life and in your work? And, and it's really interesting because you know, like I said said about my my father, while he you know I don't think he practiced being Catholic. You know, he kind of raised us Catholic because at the time in the Philippines, all of the influence of you know the the, um, the Spanish and then the the Americans kind of, you know, influenced how we were raised. And while growing up, he didn't speak Tagalog to us. He, he spoke Tagalog to his friends and he had, you know, many Filipino friends who would come and visit. And so there was so much more connection to the Filipino side than to the Mohawks side because we weren't, you know, we were not living on the reservation and there weren't very many Mohawks in Brooklyn that I knew, that we knew. And, and so... I would say that I was more influenced by my, my father's side, although the, the actual culture was not really evident, you know, like we didn't do Filipino dances growing up or, but we did eat a lot of Filipino food because my father was a gourmet cook and he used to make, you know, like all the dishes that were from his, you know, from, from the Filipino side. But what was interesting for me was when I started because of my dance background and because I was able to start this organization um, when I once I was, you know, in, in New York. One of the first other dancers that I met was a Filipino dancer who came to who wanted to teach at our at our center, and um, and she did uh, dances for Mindanao. Mindanao is the southernmost um, island in the Philippines, and it's one of the one of, I think, the only places where indigenous people, you know, like were not kind of, you know, converted by by outsiders and um, influenced by outside culture. And so they've maintained their culture. And so she does these indigenous dances from the Philippines. And because I was Mohawk, she always felt a strong connection because of the Native American connection. And so um, what I learned about the Philippines is that there is this this whole like indigenous culture that exists that um, nobody knows much about, except now due to, you know, Potri Rankamanes and, and her company, she has now a company that's celebrating 30 years of, of doing their dances and preserving their culture and their language. And um, it's amazing. It, it, it's quite extraordinary. And, and I think, you know, I feel a strong connection to her, you know, what she's doing because of also my background. 
but through the dance, she's been able to really, mean, you know, keep this this alive and this tradition um, strong. So you um, you mentioned we talked a little bit about this before the interview about the Harati uh, dance, the South Indian dance. Tell us a little bit about that and how you ended up interested in it and getting, how did you get involved basically? But the history is so fascinating, I found. Well, when I went, when I went to California to go to college, um, in order to, to take advantage of you know the free education system, you have to be a resident. So I had to establish residency first. So I took like a year off um, to you know to do that. And while I was sort of you know waiting, you know I, I became involved in a theater group, and it was through this theater group that I was in, uh, exposed to so many different cultures because the leader of the group was a poet was doing these plays, this idea, and it was kind of like an experimental idea of um, making it more of a communal kind of experience. So so anyone, everyone was invited to join. You didn't have to have any you know, training, but many artists and many, you know, people with, you know, talents and skills, you know, showed up and wanted to be part of this, this uh, theater group. And and they were basically really the center of of the of the play was about a spiritual journey, and it was about understanding like what why are we here you know what are we doing what what are we, what is the meaning of all of our life, and again at the time it was during the big uh, war protests because of the war in Vietnam and there was there was a lot of you know discussion about like what is this you know, war what does it mean to be in the middle of a war with another country and so it was all of these things in in this play that we were doing and and the dance was kind of like whatever however you felt like moving whatever inspired you to to exp however you were inspired to express yourself you know it was fine so it was kind of um an interesting experience because i had no experience in the arts no experience in dance or movement or or any of this and and it, it just opened up a whole new world that oh this is another form of expression that anyone can do and so he he had these dancers who who came and worked with us just to teach us basic movement exercises and how to like do warm-up exercises for your voice and so on and one of the people was this ballet dancer and she had gone to UCLA and taken uh, a summer workshop with Bala Saraswati. And when she came at, back after that summer session, she was telling everyone that, that this was the most extraordinary dance form she'd ever experienced, that it was very much like what we were doing in the, in the theater group, that it was music and dance and poetry and storytelling all into con combined into one dance form. And she'd never seen anything like it. And she was raving about this dance form. And she said, oh, and by the way, um, Bala Saraswati has a disciple who teaches in Berkeley. And, and so you, she said, she encouraged us all to, to um, check it out. And which I did at, when, the, when the theater company disbanded, um, I went and started taking lessons. And it was the first dance class I'd ever taken in my life. I had no idea what I was doing. I had never seen Bharatanatyam. And but the the process, the, the the learning, the learning process was so extraordinary for me. I was very interested at the time in meditation and I was also, you know, learning about Zen, Zen meditation. And when I went to these classes, I felt very much like I did after meditating, you know, for like 40 minutes. I, I'd come out of the class and I would be like, no matter how exhausted I was or how tired I was, if I took the class, I came out feeling totally like, you know, a new person. And so I just, because of that part of it, that experience, I just kept going back. I, I It was a year before I saw uh, my teacher who I was learning with perform the dance form. You know, she did a concert. It's a solo dance form. And this one person dances for two hours and does these extraordinary things. I mean, I, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like, you know, 
they use hand gestures, a very complex system of hand gestures and rhythmic footwork. And you're constantly moving and focusing on your hands. And then it's storytelling and you're expressing ideas and emotions. And I didn't understand anything about what she was dancing, but it was so beautiful to watch. I could not believe how this woman could hold my attention for two hours. And I had no idea what, what she was dancing about. <laughs> But I thought, my, this is very powerful. This is a very extraordinary thing to know how to do. And that's when I decided I wanted to go to India and study with her teacher, Bala Saraswati. And um, so I told her, I said, you know, I think I want to go to India. So she said, well, you need to write to her and see if she'll accept you as her student, because in India, there's this whole elaborate guru sishya um, relationship where the 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 teacher has to accept the, the the student and so on and that's how it all started it was like my experience of seeing someone perform the dance who was you know, outside of the culture she was an indian and um and yet she had learned this extraordinary thing and so i wrote to Bal Bala saraswati and and um i got a letter back saying that you know, I could come, but I would need to stay for three years to learn the basic foundation and da, 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 da. So I was trying to figure out how to do that. And then she came to Mills College to teach that summer. <laughs> so I, didn't, I didn't have to go to India. <laughs> <laughs> it came to you. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. For the next few years, she came. She came well, like they say, when the student is ready, it's, it's just amazing how things come up. I've been in situations where uh, I ended up in a, a mystical school where it was like I had kids and I had all these things. There was no way I could barely like get to the, you know, to the coffee shop or to the bookstore, <laughs> let alone like travel anywhere for what I needed. And then it just appeared. It's like, oh, well, we're offering this online. And I thought, OK, <laughs> you know, and this is what that sounds like. Um, So. All these experiences, you know, I'm assuming with the dance and um, your interest in arts and uh, and such has led you to become, to create or to establish the artist, uh, the Lotus Music and Dance. Was that what was behind it? Tell us a little bit, like, when did you find, you know, when did you establish that? And what was the reason behind that? What motivated you, pushed you to it? And also, what what, what does it provide? Well, I, I think that that um, after um, I think it was the uh, after I moved to New York City because my teacher had my, in one of my meetings with my teacher she was she told me that she really wanted me to be a you know, to do the dance professionally that it, it shouldn't just be a hobby it should be you know that I should do it professionally. And it, when I thought about that, I said, oh, how, how am I supposed to do that? You know, and I mean, I had no idea. But when I was living in New York, I had all these opportunities started coming up. Like I, I had a chance to go to Europe. And so I was I had performed in various places in Europe. And um, it seemed like, you know, it, every year it was like, well, how do I keep going? How do I keep developing? How do I keep? And so I did go back to India one more time. And that was when my teacher said, you know, I really think that my style should be represented in New York because that's where the, that's like the dance capital of the world. And so I said, well, I'm living in New York now so I can help to do something. And so that was the motivation. Like to initially, I started the Balasaraswati Balasara School of Music and Dance in New York. And um, it was mainly to to continue this tradition in her style. And at the same time, I met these other two people that um, were also living in New York, a disciple, of, an American disciple of um, Virju Maharaj, the, the famous Kathak dancer, the North Indian dance style, and um, Janaki Patrick. And she was and you know also teaching and performing in New York. And then there was a sitar player who was the disciple of an American disciple of Ali Akbar Khan, um, who was based in California, but she had just moved back to New York. And so we kind of formed a small group and we would we would do North and South Indian styles of music and dance. And we started doing lecture demonstrations and performances and all of this just became part of you know the the reality that um a lot of these 
very traditional art forms needed to survive by being seen and and by being able to teach the teach classes and, and pass it on to the next generation and so it all kind of started from that seed and in 1990 i was teaching my classes at a studio in new york city that was owned by the famous tap choreographer henry latang i was just renting studio space from his studio. It was like a whole eighth floor um, in a building on 27th Street. And it was mostly tap tap classes and um, tap auditions for Broadway shows because he had choreographed, made, you know, sophisticated ladies, uh, black and blue, UB. I mean, he was a very famous tap choreographer. Anyway, he, that's where I was teaching my classes. And we became friends because he would come by my class because he heard all these crazy rhythms coming out of the studio. And he asked me all about Indian dance. And and so, um, you know, like after that, when we were planning to bring, um, well, they actually then, then, by then I had started Lotus Music and Dance to continue, like the, the fact that there were so many people in New York who were doing traditional music and dance who had no place to really teach their classes and to perform. And one summer, Henry Latang, who owned that, that studio, went out to San Francisco to, uh, to put up sophisticated ladies and it took longer than normal and he didn't come back. And so they were gonna close down the studio and the super came to me one day and said, maybe you wanna take over the studio because otherwise the landlord's gonna you know, close down the place because he hadn't paid the rent. <laughs> So that's how I, we took over this. We took over that studio space, and once you know we had we had it open and running, just people just showed up. The Filipino dance group, the, <laughs> um, the flamenco dancers, everybody was looking for space <laughs> where they could teach their classes. Well, I'm curious that one of the things that came to mind is that you know did so did um, the COVID period. I'm sure during that time it was closed, but then did, were you able to? continue afterwards? I mean, did it remain hopefully? Well, actually, actually we, lo we lost that studio space before, way, well before the, um, the pandemic during Hurricane Sandy. And, and, and it didn't have anything to do with the flood that happened in, in, our, in our studio. But during that, that Hurricane Sandy, there was a, a flood from the upstairs space that totally, you know, ruined half of the the, the floor that we were on and it took the landlord you know almost eight months to fix the problem that eight months we were, had to find other places for our classes and you know scramble around to keep going and then after when it was when he did do, fix repaired the place he insisted that we paid for the rent during the time that we couldn't use the space and he said and they said if we weren't going to pay the rent they weren't going to renew our, our lease and obviously we got a lawyer and they said he can't make you pay the you know he can't make you pay the rent for the time that you couldn't occupy the space so we just you know we, we basically had to move out because there was going to be either a lawsuit or whatever and and we weren't going to you know pay the back rent so we lost the space in, in 2013 and we tried continuing the classes you know using other studios but it's very difficult to manage being in you know, all these different locations and trying to like, keep it going. So we basically just did the performances, presenting the performances and doing the arts and education programs that we do in the schools um, and focused on presenting and the classes kind of like, you know, mo most of our artists teach their classes anyway, mm -hmm. regardless of whether we do it, they, they, they will teach their classes you know, one way or another and that's sort of what has happened is the classes are still going on but they're just being done individually they're, they're being done differently this yes. way yes yeah. that's kind of yeah like we moved we've had quite a change after because of covid so many of our programming went online and right. I, I think that worked out very well because then I, we were able to reach to different communities we were yeah. more limited before right. to who yeah. we can reach how we can reach them so the COVID situation made it seem like, you know, all we did, we just changed the creative and uh, our creative uh, work into just a different platform. And so, and it still worked. We're still doing the same thing. So, but you're still active is what you're saying. You're still active. You're just in a different format. 
Um, yeah. yeah. In fact, during the pandemic, we did have to cancel our in-person events, but we were able, we managed to do them online. So we live streamed the events that we would have normally done. Right. We did keep going. The same thing with the schools. A lot of our artists were able to figure out how to, you know, do a Zoom class with the kids and, and it, it, everything kept going, but it was so much more work. It just like we're it's different, right? The technology is great, but it's also different. And there's, you know, and we're all uh, as creatives, though we can always accommodate. We always find ways. Exactly. Somehow we do. We manage we to do it. <laughs> so, um, so any, you know, last thoughts that you know you could share with us that we could, you know, for our audience, just a message that you want want to leave us with. Well, n now that we have you know, been doing live streaming, you know, our our in-person events now, like we keep, you know, like live streaming them because we we found that more people get to you know, access what we do. So we do have an event online right now, the World Dance Festival, which was Balinese dance, um, Odissi dance, Katak and Flamenco is online now. And you can go to our website and access, you know, like the program. We're also, you know, we this year, well, it took four years to, to get this this one project um, underway, but we, we wanted to tell Gandhi's story through dance, through a kind of collaborative multicultural effort. And, um, and so we had, we presented a work in progress this last, a couple Sundays ago, telling the Gandhi story, which I think is also very important for people to, to remember, you know, what he accomplished through his nonviolent, you know, movement of, of Satyagraha. And we, we tell the story through dance of what it was that allowed him to become this, you know, hero of his nation to free them from the British. So there's the Gandhi project that we would like to continue to present. And then also this message of peace that we did with the Mohawk, you know, with the about the, the Iroquois Confederacy. We've been thinking of, of trying to tell more of the story, maybe through a combination of film and dance. So, so building on what we were able to accomplish with the dance project to maybe expand it in a narrative film that tells more of the story. And so that's sort of what we're looking into now to, to go forward with that project. Where can you said that uh, all this information is available on your website? Can you the the website is Lotus Music and Dance dot org dot yeah. org. Okay, yeah, so people can find all this uh, yeah. the schedule and everything on Lotus Music and Dance. I'll be one of those visiting that okay. site. <laughs> this sounds very interesting, <laughs> especially the telling of the stories. I, I've you know, I've I've heard of it more than following that, but I'm really interested in seeing like the Gandhi story through it and learning more about the peacemaker. I, <laughs> you really got me interested in that one. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be following your work and I'm sure our audience has loved hearing about your background. Thank you. Thank you. And I definitely will come and visit. <laughs> Great. So, oh, yes, in person. You must do that. <laughs> I look forward to that. Thank you. Okay. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye.